Uh, good, morning. good morning. Happy New Year. We'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Some of you were already, a lot of us were already there in our Bible, so we'll stay there. So hop over to 1 Samuel chapter 1. It's uh, good to be here this morning. Hopefully everyone had a happy holiday, a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, um, and a good time. We, we had an eventful Christmas. Um, we were in Dallas with my family, and uh, everyone was gone, so there are no cars at the house, and Brooks was jumping on the bed, and he fell off and he bumped his head. And then we called the doctor, and the doctor said, no, that's, sorry, but we had to go, we had no car, so we had to call an ambulance. He's bleeding, he's got blood all over his face, Jenny's holding him, and he's screaming, and the ambulance comes, and I'm holding him, and I'm trying to console him, I'm like, Brooks, is going to be okay, and he's like, dad, 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 you know, he's like, He's like, oh my gosh, my heart's broken. But I said, do you want to ride in an ambulance? And he stopped screaming and he went, yes. Um, and then when he got out of the ambulance, before they sewed up his head, he was like, again, again, again. So anyway, he won't remember it, but it was a little bit scary from, you know, it's worse for mom and dad in those situations. But we are here. He's got a little, he's got a little, you know, a little scar here. Hopefully that doesn't scar too bad. But um, if not, what are you going to do? So we're here. Hopefully you had a less eventful holiday than I did, um, but it's good to be back together, Capital Rivers Church. And we get to start off the year with a theme called seeking. And so we're going to talk about what it means to seek, uh, to seek God. And we're going to be in 1 Samuel. First, the reason we're talking about Samuel, by the way, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel in the original text are not separate. They're the same book. And so uh, the, the beginning, think of it as one book. The beginning of 1 Samuel, the end is kind of in 2 Samuel. It's one one work. And, and Samuel is really about a transition period for the nation of Israel. Transition from a time of judges. If you've read Judges, there's a certain sentence that's repeated throughout the book of Judges. That is, in the time of Judges, everyone did as they saw fit because Israel had no king. Um, sort of like, it was a rough time. If you've read Judges, it's probably the most difficult book to read in the Bible because of all the horrible things that happen. Um, and so we see in Samuel a transition that there's going to be, the nation of Israel is going to want a monarch. They want a leader. They want political stabilization. They want to get organized. Okay. And, and so they, they start to demand, and we'll read this throughout this year, they'll demand for a king. They'll want a king. And the author of 1 Samuel will start in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. The reason we want to talk about this as a church is um, in, in some ways, um, in the last couple of years, last few years, um, you know, it's been a, a time of destabilization spiritually uh, uh, in terms of a church organization or even spiritual organization, political organization, right? We've gone through a lot of change and upheaval, and it can be tempting in those times. At some point, you want to, you kind of want to get back to being organized. You want to get back to rhythm and consistency in any aspect of your life. But there are certain pitfalls and certain general mistakes that humans make when they look for, you know, a king or a queen or a leader or an idol, or a way to organize their life. And so we thought that this might be the best time to look at the book of 1 Samuel and to take the lessons that 1 Samuel will teach us. And so we'll start in 1 Samuel 1, verse 1, and we'll begin reading. It says, there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim in the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, uh, Tohu son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved her though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not worth more than 10 sons? It might sound like you're encouraging your wife in that moment. By the way, to say, I know we don't have kids, but hey, you got me. Um, it might not sound as good as you think it sounds. Um, just a little advice if that ever comes up in your life. 
After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord and Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Take your wine away from you. The men in this story so far are not doing great with their commenting on the situation. Um, but Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have not, I have neither drunk uh, wine nor drink, but I've been pouring out my heart to the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out out of great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord, and they went back to the house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called him Samuel. For she said, I have asked the Lord for him. The man Elkanah and his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up there uh, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young, and they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli, and she said, Oh, Lord, as you live, my Lord, I it's the woman who was standing here in, the, in your presence, praying to the Lord, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. You know, it's writing an Old Testament book is a, is a, writing any book in the Bible is an arduous process. It's very difficult and it takes a long time. And usually, especially in the Old Testament, it's after probably generations of uh, oral history of it being passed down by mouth, by, by story time, by telling the story to your kids and then it being passed down and these types of things. And, um, What's curious about this is if the book is called First Samuel, this is about Samuel's birth. But what's amazing is that we all, if you're reading this book, you kind of know, most people will know who's the first king of Israel and kind of where we're heading in the story. And by the way, the Old Testament is your spiritual history. When you read the Old Testament, it's your spiritual ancestry. It's the same as so my physical ancestry may be, you know, Denmark and you know, Ireland and Scotland and these things, but my spiritual, my faith history, our faith history, how cool is this? This is the story of our family. This is the story of our people. And this is what they did. This is how they acted. And so we get to read about, man, this is our family history. We're the Old Testament. That's what we're seeing. And what the author of First Samuel is doing is something amazing. He, he's, he doesn't start uh, with Hannah for no reason. He's trying to say something. Why does he start with Hannah? And what's the point of this story? And where is he going? Now, Hannah here is an, is an incredible woman. She's an incredible example. By the way, she's, uh, Elkanah has two wives. This is very rare in the Old Testament, very rare in Hebrew history. Uh, polygamy was not common at all. Happens only a few times, uh, mostly with royalty. Those are for political reasons you have that. But when you see it like this happen, it's mostly because of a case of infertility. Hannah's probably the first wife she cannot conceive. She cannot bear kids. Having kids was essential to livelihood. It was essential to the community. It was essential to uh, the, the, the future salvation of your tribe, of your clan, of your people. Having kids was so important that it meant, okay, let's actually pull in another person, another woman, so that we can have kids. So we can have kids. Now, that doesn't take away how difficult that would have been for him, right? Especially at this time. Not only does she, she greatly desire a child, you know, I, I imagine she desires a child for personal reasons, but also for cultural reasons. Also, the shame that would have that would have been her coming her way, but not having a kid. 
And also the text calls the other wife her rival, right? I mean, it's, it had gotten to a point for Hannah, I think, where this had become very difficult. And I, and I can't imagine where you are so excited to have a kid, to have a family. Not only can you not do that, but you're actually forced to watch somebody else do it with your husband in front of you every day. You get to see somebody else's kids. You get to visualize that. I mean, it's just pain. And she is in anguish. She is struggling. She is like, she's going to God. She's praying. You know, I imagine she's praying so charismatically that obviously Eli thinks she's drunk. Um, so she's move, moving her mouth and she's praying to God. I don't know if you've been, uh, anyone's ever been to the Western Wall or seen people pray at the Western Wall or seen um, Jews pray at the Western Wall, but they pray like this and they pray like this. Um, they pray with their body. And I, but I imagine she's doing even more than that. I imagine she's, and Eli, who's kind of, kind of blind, as we'll see later, uh, is, is blind again here. He's like, ah, man, sh- come on, don't, don't come to church drunk. Ah, this generation, you know. What's up, these kids today, man? Uh, back when I was coming up in Shiloh, the tabernacle, we didn't used to get drunk at church. And he's talking about that. And she stands up. She goes, listen here, I'm not drunk. I'm not pouring out wine. I'm pouring out my heart. And I'm doing that because I am in anguish. I am struggling. And Eli goes, you know what? All right, this is going to be granted. This request of yours is going to be granted. There's something interesting in this passage that you don't get so much in the English. And when you get, you get this more if you're hearing it at story time at night. And, you know, if you're by the fire and it's nighttime and you ask your your mom or your dad to tell you the story of Saul, Samuel and Saul again, the first kings of Israel. And, And here within this passage, there's a verb that's used six times, and the word, is, the verb is Shaul, uh, Shaul in Hebrew. And even at the very end, uh, it says, the very last verse there, it says, therefore I have Shaul'd him to the Lord, and as long as he, he lives, he is Shaul'd to the Lord. Shaul means to request or to, uh, to lend. What does Shaul sound like? Saul, Saul's name. So Saul's name is repeated six times. Saul's name repeated six times in this passage. Saul is nowhere in this passage. Saul is not going to show up for six more chapters. So why in the world would the author choose very specifically to use Saul's name talking about Hannah and Samuel? And it seems to be, if you know what's coming a little bit about who Saul will be and why Saul is chosen, because he's attractive, because he's tall, because he's a warrior, because he kind of checks all the worldly boxes of what success looks like. The author is saying, you think that's going to be your Saul, but the real Saul is here. The real Saul that you want, the Saul, the king that you want, is not the king that you'll demand. The kingly heart is Samuel. But even more than that, the kingly heart is in his mom. Because I think what's great about Samuel is we can say, well, Samuel, he's, he's the Saul that, he's, that, that, that Saul is supposed to be, which is true. But what's cool is, is that Samuel doesn't choose to go live in the tabernacle at Shiloh. His mom makes that decision. Samuel is, is kind of born into it, and Samuel does a lot of great things, but I'm amazed by the faith of a mother here, and the power of prayer, and the power of persistence, even when she's not directly involved in his life, and what's, it's, it's a one miracle for her to receive the gift of having a son. You know what's another miracle? is to give that gift back. I think sometimes we think Christianity is, man, I just got to go to God with my requests, But what happens when you receive your request? That's Christianity. What do you do once you receive it? How do you act? And Hannah is an example of what an Israelite is supposed to be, how they're supposed to act. And she receives that gift and she gives that gift back. You know, we live in a world, I think we talk about desires. Hannah desired, and I talk about why, culturally, personally, whatever the reason is, she desired a child desperately. And for us, I think our desires are very important to us. We all have desires. We all have things we want for different reasons. Some are personal, some are cultural, some we, we want because we only, other people have them. You know, I talk about this sometimes. My wife and I, we struggled with uh, having Brooks uh, infertility for a few years. And I remember the first few months we, we try to have Brooks and you, you don't, you know, I'm not, not pregnant. Right. And I remember being like, okay, that's fine. You know, actually being fine with it, being, being uh, content. But then you know what happens is 
you find out your friends who are the same age or even younger all have, hey, we're pregnant. Hey, we're pregnant. Hey, we're pregnant. And you're kind of going, and then you instantly get mad. Like your whole body changes. I got frustrated. I got mad. And I was like, wait, wait, I was fine 30 seconds ago. I was okay 30 seconds ago, but the second I find out other people have this thing that I think I should have before them, I, now I'm angry. Now I'm mad. Now I'm sad. Now I isolate. You know, human beings, we're emotional beings, right? We got a lot of emotions. The emotional part of the brain was developed millions of years before the logical. So those of you who are like, I'm logical. All right. Biological evolution would say, the emotional, no one really makes a purely logical decision. You're right. We, there's a, we all have those emotions. Now, whether we identify them as a whole other conversation, um, but we have them. They're in us. And we think about these desires that we have. And these, these desires, it's amazing how things happen in our lives. And our whole week, our whole sense of happiness is based on whether we're receiving desires or not, whether our expectations are met or not. Um, it's why when you get engaged, right, one of the very first premarital uh, uh, counseling studies you do is, is expectations. It's a massive one, right? Because so many fights can come from just, I had different expectations than you did. And I think in the world, the world says that we should base our faith around our desires. To base our faith around what our desire, what does that mean? You know, what kind of church are you looking for? Well, I really want a church with a good children's ministry, right? I, I want a church with a good worship ministry. I want a church that, where people really get me. I want a church that's close by. You know, I, I really need God. I, I want a, a family group. I want this. I want that. I want preaching to be a little bit more of this, a little bit less of that. I, I, here's my desires, and I'm going to build my faith kind of around those desires. And then God comes along and says, hold on, that's not what it is. I think you should actually base your desires around your faith. Your desire should come from your faith. And I think that's what's what amazing here about, about Hannah. What do you guys think? Do you think that Hannah, when she prayed, God, give me a son. And when I get him, I'll give him back. You think that was like, I just want a son. And I'm kind of going to say whatever here. And maybe who knows what happens. Maybe I change my mind. You know, maybe I don't give him back. I don't want to say Hannah thought that. But I, sometimes I pray like that. Where I'm like, God, if you give me this, then I'll do X, Y, Z. And man, X, Y, Z get forgot about real quick. You know, human beings remember negative experiences with way more detail than positive ones. We're really good at remembering, remembering negative experiences. We're like PhDs at that. But when it comes to remembering a positive experience, we struggle. And I think I want to come up with three things. I think, how is Hannah able to, able to give back to the Lord? And I had, had three kind of ideas because we, we don't want to follow what the world says to build faith around our desires because then that's no faith at all. It's just me following the, the church of Drew or the faith of Drew. And that's, and my desires change all the time. My expectations change all the time. And I'm heavily influenced by my culture, by what culture tells me I need. It's amazing how that's affected, but we want to, to be stable and to not be up and down, tossed back and forth by every wind and wave of teaching, right? To be emotionally up and down. We want to be stable Faith is here, and those desires, right, they circulate. They, they revolve around the faith. They don't go away, but they are offshooting from the faith rather than, let me kind of build my faith around my desires. Um, because our desires, they are whimsical. They change, and we're not, we're not reliable in that department um, because we are, we are so fickle in that sense. So I'd rather have our faith based on something that never moves, right, which is God or the word of God. So we talk about this, and number one, I think three ways that she's able to give back a gift to God. Number one is she, she trusts in the Lord and pours out her feelings. She trusts in the Lord by pouring out her feelings. What's cool about that is that in, it says in the, in the passage there in 1 Samuel 1 that she poured out her soul, some versions say, some versions say poured out her heart. Um, some translations will say poured out her feelings to God uh, in her prayer. And what's cool is that you can look at this one later, but in Psalm chapter 62, verse eight, Psalm 62, verse eight says, trust in the Lord at all times by pouring out your heart to him. Trust in the Lord at all times by pouring out your heart. What is it saying? Trust is equal to pouring out your heart. Now that's, that's a challenging passage for me because my heart, when you try to pour it, it like, it drips a little bit. And it's like, there's a big, there's a lot of, there's a lot of clogging there. 
my, my heart, I'm not good at that. I didn't grow up with that. And even some, my experience in church was not necessarily that that was really facilitated or encouraged. So not only was I bad at it, I got no practice at it. That's a bad combination. When you're bad at identifying emotion and they get no practice for it, and then you're told to lead a church at 24, bad things happen, right? Now, what's cool is, is that you guys are wonderful people. You guys are full of grace and you give your leaders so much grace and you forgive and you teach us things. So I learned amazing lessons in Charlottesville, right? When I, when I led there, but I think I could say that the one thing God has been teaching me over the last five to eight years is how to pour out my heart to him. And I think church, we got to get really, really good at this. We got to get really, really good at this because we can become slaves to our feelings if we're not aware of them. And when we're slaves to our feelings, we say things, we have inappropriately expressed anger that comes out and it hurts people. We self-isolate, we pull away and that hurts ourselves and others. We, we, we have a low sense of, you might call it self-esteem or, or self-image. When these things happen, if we don't become aware, I'm not talking about you got to fix it. Now we were saying earlier, Jesus is going to fix it. Amen to that. I'm just saying, become aware of them. Become aware. That's the, that's the first thing about what it is to be a disciple. C.S. Lewis said, to be a Christian demands the, the utmost sense of self-awareness. You just got to call it what it is. Be honest with yourself about who you are. Trust in the Lord. Pour out your feelings. And, and one thing I wanted to share about this is this idea of lament. You know, when we lament, there's something that we do that's powerful. Sometimes we pray, and I don't know how you pray, but one of the things I've been practicing is praying like this. Praying an emotion, identifying that emotion, right? And then hinging it onto a character about God, a characteristic about God. You see what Hannah does in her prayer. She says, God, I pray for a son. I know that you remember your servants. Remember your servant and the afflicted. She's praying, not basing it on, okay, if I, if I get the son, I'll give him. She says that. But before she says that, she says, God, I know that you listen. I know that you hear. I know that you care about those who are downtrodden, afflicted, marginalized. And so when you pray, you say, God, I am angry. But if you just leave it there, you don't end on something that's, that's rock solid, resolute, and never changes. The anchor of the prayer is the character of God. So it's God, I'm angry, but I know that you care about justice more than I do. I know that. God, I'm frustrated. God, I'm frustrated when I see people treated this way, but I know you care about them too. I know you're also considering God. I know that you're thinking, I know that this is consuming you the way it consumes me, but even more so. God, I know that you take care of people. God, I'm so done. I'm so discouraged by the sin in my life that will not leave. I can't do it anymore, but I know, God, that you have grace. You see, on a little bit, in a small way, you're kind of preaching to yourself, right? You're not staying in that feeling. You're acknowledging it, and then you're shifting, you're hinging to a characteristic of God. What's beautiful about that is you get to do the one-two punch. Of, I'm, I'm aware, but I'm walking away with a sense of peace. God will deal with justice. God will take care of this thing. God, will, God, is, a, God is on it. God's on the job. And we can see that, that Hannah actually begins the book of Samuel, a book that could have started with David, a book that could have started with Saul, a book that could have started immediately with Samuel when he was a grown man, starts with Hannah. Because we got to listen to this church. God wants you to know this, that this is, it's so easy to just go out there and, and pretend to be a Christian. It's so easy to pretend to be a person of faith. And we're, we're, we're trained by our culture to say the right thing and do the right thing and have the right status, to have the right, uh, you know, away message, to have the right social media presence. So we're, we're literally receiving instant feedback about things that we post online immediately. I post something and no one likes it. It's like, okay, don't do that again. I post something and everyone likes it, do that again. You're receiving instant, massive feedback about how to be. And so now you're just conditioned. You're just this, I got to do, I can't, no, 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 yeah, 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 no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just, and it's just it's overwhelming and it's up and down and it changes every week. If you follow anything that human activity is or was or will be, that's what it'll be. But if we can focus and, and, and rest ourselves in the character of God, we can find that peace. And that, I think, is the secret, one of the secrets to Hannah giving back this gift. How difficult would it have been to give back the gifts? My goodness. Now, you might say, well, Drew, back in those times, they weaned kids longer. Okay, but that's still like 
you know, giving a two or three year old Samuel back. You know, I just, my heart would break thinking about that with Brooks. She's able to give back. And I think, I think church, sometimes we receive, we receive, um, we don't give back. And this is, there's a whole generation, I think it's so tempting, right? To receive that child and then just to smother them for 20 years. To not let them develop convictions of their own. To not let them live. To not let them grow. To not let them experience failure. To let them develop their own sea legs. To guide, to trust, to let them go out into the world. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not preaching extremes. I'm just saying, I think sometimes we take a gift and we're a little bit too tight-fisted with it. We receive the money. We receive the location. We receive the friendships, the social networking. We receive all these things from God. And I wonder how much of us are like Hannah and saying, here go, God, here's the right back. How much of us, how many of us just kind of hold on to it? And then we're mad that we don't have more. And then we're mad that we don't have more. And then we're angry and we leave God because he didn't give us what we wanted. But we're unaware of all the things he gave us. The thousands of things, the thousands of answered prayers that God has answered in your life. And that's the second thing. The first thing was trust in the Lord by pouring out her feelings. The second thing is her gratitude at her request being given. She remembers, right? She's grateful. She says the word, I have found favor in the Lord's eyes. She's, she's excited to tell Eli, right? Remember, she's like, you were drunk. You thought I was drunk. That was me. And I'm back with that kid. And he's right here. And I'm giving him to the Lord. I'm giving him to the priestly service. And she's excited. She remembers, I think church, we got to practice the discipline of remembering the good things. If you're better at remembering negative things, we have to learn the discipline of remembering the positive things. God is smart. It's why since the beginning of time, he's given us Passover meals so that the kid can ask, why are we doing this? And you say, I'm glad you ask, young child. We're doing this because we're remembering the slavery of our people in Egypt. We're remembering how God delivered them. Why do we take communion? Thank you for asking. Because it symbolizes Christ's bones breaking, his flesh being torn for you, for me, and his blood being poured out. And we remember that once a week. All these things we do, we can practice remembering the good things and, and, and being able to recall the good things. Sometimes one good memory can get you through a lot of tough times. One amazing memory. You know, you're going through a tough time. Oh, it was awesome when we did that men's retreat and we... That was, that was incredible. Having those memories to remember and, and not let Satan just bombard you with all the negative. It's hard enough because the world throws at you the negative. If you're bombarding yourself with negative and the world bombards you with negative, that's tough. It's going to be a, it's going to be a, a negative life. We got to develop the discipline of remembering the good. And the third thing is her hope in the resurrection. You know, I don't think it's lost on any of us that she says, God, you loaned me my son. I'm going to loan him back. I thought that was interesting. What do you mean you're going to loan him back? And I'm going to loan him back all the days of his life. Wait, so when do you get him back again? You know, and, and there's something amazing here that, that's great. And there's a story in the book of 2 Maccabees where a, a woman, because her sons are not following the ways of the Greeks, uh, her sons are tortured and killed in front of her. It's a horrible story. Seven sons, they're tortured and killed one by one in front of the mom until she, and she, they're trying to get the kids to be an example to basically cave and become like the Greeks, to eat like the Greeks, to act like the Greeks, to have the same sexual thoughts as the Greeks, to live like sexually, all those things that the Greeks do. And the, son, the sons were dying one by one. And what the mom says to the last son, they're like, do you want us to kill the last one? And what she says, this is Second Maccabees 4, she says, no, go ahead. You might as well go ahead and kill them. I will receive them back at the resurrection. And I can't wait to see them again. And what's beautiful about, I don't know that that's Hannah's thinking here. It seems to be something like that. I will get to see my son again. And sometimes we live in a time where uh, the eternal life judgment, a life after death is not as common as it used to be. Look at any hymn written between 1900 and 1975. They're all about heaven, right? Can't wait to get to heaven. I'll see you when I'm there. You can't get there on roller skates or in a washing machine but you can get there, right? We sing about heaven. But when we, when we have a hope in the future, it can give us the power to do good now, to do courageous things we never would do. We got to have the hope of the resurrection at the fore of our mind again, because it gives us courage to be able to do things we never could do. There's a great song I've been singing recently. I just learned of it. 
It's called Sing to Me of Heaven. And it goes, sing to me of heaven. Let me fondly dream of its golden glory and its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, the sweetest song of all. That when we have an eye on where we're going in heaven, that we're able to do courageous things now. She's able to give back her son. If there is no heaven, then it's just, right? Samuel, you're with me all your life. And, and, and he just, she would keep Samuel to herself. I wonder if she kept Samuel to herself. Would he become the man that he was going to be? If she had smothered him, right? But she's able to give him back. That is so tough to give back her son to God. Now, in her, it's a very literal way to the, priestly, to the priesthood. I think for us, I wonder what is, what is difficult for us to give back to God? What are we holding on to? What are we clinging on to? What is so precious to us that we won't give it back? And I think this is the difference between us being involved in the kingdom of God and committed to the kingdom of God. A lot of us are involved in the kingdom of God, but not so many of us are committed to the king, right? Committed to the kingdom of God. And I don't know if I said this earlier or not, but I don't think so. Committed to the king is my title. So I don't think I said that, but committed to the king, right? If we're not committed, right? And my dad used to talk about the difference between being involved and being committed. And he said it was a lot like ham and eggs, right? See, the chicken is involved in the process of ham and eggs, but by golly, that pig's committed. And that's what we're talking about, right? Got to give it a second. Um, we talk about like, are we involved in the kingdom of God or are we committed? And all of us in our hearts, we want to be committed. I know we do because you're here today. You're here today. You want to be committed, but you know, there's these things, there's these fears. If I commit, what will happen? This bad thing could have this bad thing. Listen, I'm not talking about being committed to, to a church or even to a leader. I'm talking about being committed to God. Commit, that's, that's where it starts. That's where it starts. And everything from there goes. But if we're not committed to the king, committed to God, we're going to be looking for Saul's everywhere. Oh, that works. Oh, this is what I want. This is my desire. This is what I'll do. This is what I'm kind of hoping for. But for the Capitol Rivers Church going into this year, if nothing else, I hope, I pray that at Christmas time we can say, man, we became, as a church, more committed to God, more committed to the king. We gave gifts back to God. We prayed for them and we gave them back to him. I'm going to close out with a, a, there's a, a paradox prayer I want to read, and then I have a closing thought, but there's a paradox prayer, right? And it, it kind of talks a little bit about, we pray for things, but what happens when we don't receive them? Um, because Hannah and Saul are very different people. Hannah asks and gives back, Saul will take and keep for himself. Hannah is a woman of conviction, Saul is a slave to his people. Hannah pours out her feelings. Saul is controlled and deceived by his feelings. Hannah prays with all her heart. Saul hides from God and then blames him. Hannah gives her son life by letting go. Saul will kill his son by holding on. And we see here the example of a king is not Saul. It is not Saul. It's our ancestor, our great-great-grandmother, Hannah. The paradox prayer goes like this. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I asked, I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might fill the need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I among all most richly blessed. The lesson today leaves, leaves out one final question, which is, okay, Drew, you're saying when I receive a gift, I got to give it back. But what happens if you never received a gift? What happens if you never receive what you ask for? And there was a man about a thousand years after this who prayed earnestly. He was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He poured out his heart to God with an earnest request and he did not receive what he asked for. You know, little did Hannah know that she would be in chapter one of a book, right? Little did Hannah know that the cameras of heaven would zoom in on her as the example. But here's the thing. She and her son would embody the heart of a king. But what about Jesus? 
Jesus would desperately pray and not receive what he asked for. But here's the thing is when we are anchored in God and our, our desires are not what make up our faith, but our faith rather is built around, our desires are built around our faith. We're able to actually handle a no from God and not let it destroy us. That we're actually able to say, God, I pray for this. No, those powerful words, your will be done. That Jesus is able to receive a no from God. That if you have a request this morning and are hearing the answer, no, that you're in good company. Um, that like Jesus, may, maybe you'll receive it someday like Hannah, but maybe you won't like Christ. Either way, the goal is not our desire. The goal is God. And we'll be able to, even when we don't receive our gifts, we'll be able to be like Christ. We'll be able to also know that in our failure, Christ's sacrifice covers our sins. But if we do receive that gift, I pray that we can all be like Hannah and say, God, you have lent this to me and I will lend it back. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank you.